Thank you, guys. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I uh, came across this interesting library that uh, looked like it might solve some of the problems I was having um, building apps. And uh, turns out uh, it's been kind of a really enjoyable experience. So I'm happy to, uh, to share what I've learned so far with you guys. Um, it's a brief outline, spoilers for my talk. Um, gonna, so my talk, D3, building web apps with D3. Um, gonna explain why uh, you might do that, um, and then go through some tips and tricks, and then also kind of just recap and uh, give you give you an idea of the lay of the land, what uh, you know, pros and cons, what to expect when uh, building, doing this uh, web apps with D three JS. This should back up a bit, uh, you know, explain what D three is. Um, how many how many have I guess heard of it? All of you probably by now. Uh, how many have used it? Okay, great, a good portion. Um, that's awesome. I hopefully uh, support you both. Um, D3 kind of has is a bit notorious for its deep learning curve, but uh, once you once you're able to use it, it's super powerful. So glad a lot of you have uh, have used it. So some of the slides will make more sense, but I'll try and make sure everybody uh, keeps up here. Um, so. D3.js, if you go to uh, D3's homepage, you'll see a lot of uh, cool samples of, of using D3. Uh, it's, it's really, it's a JavaScript visualization library, and uh, people are doing really cool stuff. Uh, the, one of the previous talks mentioned, yeah, D3 is great for um, building visualizations with SVG. Um, pretty much anything data-driven, uh, you can see all of these are graphs of, well, I'm not sure what's going on in the top left corner, but, but it looks pretty awesome, too. Um, uh, but most of the others are, uh, are all uh, data-driven visualizations. Um, but D3 stands for data-driven documents. What's, what's that about? I thought this was about graphics, right? Well, it turns out um, all D3 is really doing all you're really doing when you're making a visualization with D3 is applying data to DOMs, to a document object model. Um, uh, you grab some DOM elements, uh, and you can uh, work on them kind of in bulk. Um, this may look actually familiar. I love how uh, if you go to the D3 homepage and kind of just work through the introduction, I love how he introduces it because it kind of you kind of realize, hey, this looks kind of a lot like another JavaScript library we're used to using, right? Kind of fetching, fetching and acting on like a whole array of of objects in bulk. Like we're all pretty familiar with that from say jQuery. Um, D3 goes not a ton further, really, but it goes one step further, and that makes like all the difference. Um, uh, and it's the data part, data-driven documents. Um, you can take uh, an array of information and apply it to these elements in your array very gracefully, very succinctly. Um, so I started thinking, hmm, this, this could be useful for um, some of the stuff I'm building that's not really graphics related, um, not directly anyway. Um, there's a, you might be familiar with the quote, um, there's only two hard things in computer science, right? Cache and validation and naming things. Sometimes people add off by one errors. Um, uh, what's this cache and validation thing about? Um, do we, like, we aren't writing, like, microprocessors or, like, we just kind of use memcache or let, you know, our web frameworks do that for us. Um, actually, if you're building apps or building any software, really, I suspect you are dealing with, with cache invalidation. Um, here's, here's an app that I, I've, I've built, actually, with D3. Um, you can see this is a, a, a research project. It's still kind of in gray box form, so sorry. It's not uh, particularly uh, graphic designed yet. Um, but uh, you can see there's a lot on the page. Um, it's, it's certainly a complex app. Um, and we're displaying data from all these different sources. Uh, users can interact with it. Um, it actually, uh, we make sure it stays in sync across tabs and all that. Um, and you end up with this trouble, um, of this, this cache invalidation problem, um, because in a sense, what the user is seeing is kind of just, it, it's not the real data that we're storing in the database. It's a representation of it that needs to be like quick and up to date, but it's not really the real data. It's a cache, right? 
Um, so the problem we have in building apps a lot of times is a problem of sync. Uh, keeping the interface in sync uh, with the database, keeping the data, you know, the models in the JavaScript in sync with the DOM. Um, and also, there's, there's some element of transform in there, but, but at its core, we're, we're wanting to make sure that like, our caches stay correct, right? Our, our, what the user is viewing stays correct. Um, for a bit more on sync, I'd, I'd recommend just a, a nice little introduction to kind of the, the two ways of doing things um, here. Uh, there was a, a nice talk at uh, Realtime Conf. Uh, this, these slides will be up too, so don't worry about like copying down all these long, full URLs. Um, but uh, uh, Anant just, just pointed out um, that a lot of times when we go to solve problems, I, our, our first inclination is to do it via what he called message passing. That's honestly, that's kind of the jQuery style where you're like, okay, when you click this button, we need to do these actions kind of thing or, you know, fire this off. Um, whereas uh, a, a better architecture, a better, um, more scalable, so to speak, architecture often comes out of thinking of your design, pro your code design problem as a data synchronization problem and keeping your data in sync between all these different components of your app. Um, and D3 is actually um, pretty good at, at keeping data or your DOM in sync with your data. Um, so we had that kind of earlier example where, I, sorry, I didn't explain it real well, um, but, but that earlier example basically just took this, this array of items and kind of put it in a list. Um, this example, though, allows you to change the array of items. You can see um, we're, we're doing a breakfast here, eggs, bacon, coffee. We'll display that in the DOM. But then we're going to, maybe the next day we're feeling like a little healthier. So we're going to get rid of the coffee uh, just because it makes us jittery. And uh, um, I guess, sad but true, we're going to replace the bacon with spinach. Um, and, and update the DOM. Well, D3 handles this uh, pretty elegantly. Um, this is one of the first things, if you can grasp if you can get good at, at this pattern, like you pretty much know all there is to know about D3, not quite, but the rest, the rest ends up being just like helper, helper uh, operators and helper um, manipulation stuff. Um, the, the, the core pattern of D3 is you take this, uh, usually an array of data, and you apply it to an array of DOM objects, and you get this kind of this diff, this difference between what's in the DOM right now and what is in the data and needs to be in the DOM. Uh, you get, uh, you, you might not have enough elements in your DOM. You can see we start out with just an empty uh, unordered list there. And so the first time through, um, we're gonna put all three of those things in. We're gonna, uh, it, uh, in D3 it's called the entering selection. For every item in the entering selection, for every new item, we're gonna append an LI. Now, at this point, we don't actually set the data. Um, we're gonna first going to remove any extra ones. So in the case of the second update, where we've popped an item off the end of the array, we're going to have too many list items. Uh, and so that little line of code will come into play and, and remove that extra list item. And then for all the list items that are still in the DOM, we want to make sure that um, they match up with the array. Because, for example, we change the second item from bacon to spinach. We want to make sure that list item uh, stays in sync with, with our data there. Um, and we do a bit of a transform. Uh, D3 lets you um, just apply random uh, your own functions as these kind of operators on, for example, the text of every item. Uh, so in this case, we're uh, just capitalizing the first letter and then throwing the rest on. Um, so what does this have to do with, with apps? Um, back up maybe one more step. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a firm believer that the web is its own platform. Like, I think some people get excited about like, building cross-platform apps like with the web. Like, I don't really think like, the web is just the way you can get the Windows app and the Android app and uh, the, the Mac app all you know, with, with the same code base. Like, the web is its own platform. Um, and as, as I was kind of thinking through what, what, what I really meant by that sort of idea and, 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 and how that like, affects the apps I'm writing, I came across this really neat essay uh, by Brett Victor. He's been making the rounds. Um, that's kind of how I found him was through one of his early demos of uh, um, the, the thing Brett Victor, the guy who wrote this essay, um, 
is on about now is um, just really visual interactions. So uh, with with code and with with thinking, basically visualizing what you're thinking. Um, this essay, which he must have spent a great deal of time on, it's this awesome, like epic, long essay with cool footnotes and styled, like really like written for the web kind of. Um, in this essay, though, um, Brett Victor talks about um, what, what do we use software for? He says there's really just three types of apps. Um, there's information apps, there's manipulation apps, and there's communication apps, which let you kind of read and write. It's, essentially, communi communication app is just the combination of the first two. And, and really, I think most of the apps we have, have we write, have elements of both information and like re letting the user read, take in information, and also put back and manipulate what, what they're seeing. So really, most of the apps we're writing are communication apps. Now, in this, in this essay, Magic Inc., that, that Brett wrote, um, he claims and that manipulation software design is hard. Um, if you've ever tried to make a really usable interface that involves a lot of editing, um, it, it can be hard, especially if you're kind of having to go beyond like normal conventions and, 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 and let the user manipulate something that they don't commonly do in every other app. Um, but he says, manipulation software design is hard, but most software is information software. Um, and I would like to claim kind of in line with that, like most of the software writing is both information and manipulation, but most of every app we write can be information. And he actually, the, the sort of the overarching point of, of this Magic Inc. article is to encourage that, saying reduce the amount of manipulation and, and convert that as much as you can to say, don't make the user edit and interact with the computer, just show them what they need to say. Um, so um, w with that in mind, like D3 starts to make a little more sense now, right, for writing apps. D3 is really good at presenting information in a web page. So uh, it, it, it really, when you, when you kind of think through it, it ends up being not so surprising that D3 can be a really powerful tool for building web apps. Um, now, D3 does do some manipulation, too. We'll uh, get a bit more in depth in the tips and tricks and, and, and following sep sections. I don't want to make it sound like, oh, like you won't be able to edit you know, anything in your app if you use D3. That's, that's not true. You can do um, uh, various, um, essentially, it lets you add event handlers, which then get the same pattern of, of access to the data that was, uh, D3 calls it binding in a sense, that was bound to your selection. So if somebody edits in a text field, like you'll know which object that came from, so to speak. Um, so let's just dive into a bit of how it's done. Um, when you're building a web app, uh, something that always kind of comes up, hopefully at the beginning, is like the, the templating. How are we going to actually, like, we're going to have probably a team of designers and whatever. We, we have this kind of spectrum of we need like the layout we need and the CSS and everything all the way down to like the back end, right? And somewhere in between we want a nice way of like turning data into a DOM that we create out of nothing, you know, right? Um, and a lot of times we'll use like a templating language or something like that. So as I started building apps with D3, that was kind of one of the things I missed first, was like just a way to be like, here's HTML. Like started out, kind of have this pattern like, here's building a DOM, sort of maybe the, the naive or the <laughs> initial way with, with D3 is, OK, we're going to take an existing selection, which we got or you know, made. We're going to append a form. Then we're going to start appending stuff to that. We have to kind of uh, capture that initial form selection in a variable so that we can add multiple things. D3 lets you chain quite easily. We could append sort of a single set of children all the way down, only child, I guess. But if we want to actually append multiple, we kind of have to store that selection in a variable, reuse it. Um, and a another problem with this code is, is you can't really see the DOM structure like a good templating language, like it looks a lot like HTML, or it looks like a, a lot like something you want to see that at least maps to HTML, right? Um, so this wasn't a, a real great way to do it. I thought, okay, maybe we can just like indent this better or something, right? So now you can actually see kind of the structure I was going for in the first 
first time, you can see that, okay, those last two items I add are children of sort of the, the third to last. Um, and you can kind of see the stru structure, but now we have to, like, it's almost worse, because at least in, in this pattern, we have to give names to everything. And as, as we learned, right, naming, naming is also a hard problem. Um, uh, and, you know, the indentation's a little, like, not normal, like, just, we're just kind of making up our own, like, indentation style there. Um, finally, I, I, I discovered through what we'll talk about next, uh, but, but a pattern that did work. And those of you not familiar with D3, like, you're probably thinking, boy, this still isn't, like, handlebars, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, it, it, it certainly... Um, gives you a sense of both the structure and it, it, it's, it's a, it ends up being a really sane way to do this, as well as um, this, um, this structure, which I'll talk about, um, gives you a way to do kind of the, the syncing the way you have without needing even extra variables for the, uh, the entering and the exiting selection and everything. Um, so D3 has this kind of... Uh, when you're first learning D3, you learn about these operators. You can, you can set the text of every element. You can append things to elements. You can set attributes, properties. Um, similar, again, to jQuery, where you can, you know, you have these, uh, D3 calls them operators, because it lets you, you know, operate, basically apply your data to the selection. Um, it has this operator, I guess you'd call it, called call that basically just gives you the same selection, but as a parameter or a function. And you think, oh, that's kind of lame. But uh, it's a, it's a really, it actually really cleans up the code a whole lot, um, where you can see now we have the structure, we kind of have the indent, um, uh, but we don't have to like, think of names for every, every element here. And, and, and yes, I would recommend when you're using D3, just consistently use like, the same variable name, select D, I, J. Um, you know, that's not typical, like, good coding practice, but I think it is idiomatic within D3, like, rather than having to think, okay, what am I going to call this array? I, I give um, meaningful names to my data and just let sort of the D3's dominion structure stuff just kind of use the, the normal D3 variable names. Um, uh, this call pattern I discovered through a, an essay by Mike uh, Bostock, who wrote D3, um, he's, he's got a lot of good little essays. Um, I, they should all be linked in the D3.js wiki, um, but uh, he's done a lot of writing on you know, using D3 effectively, I think as he's worked through like effective use. One of the things, uh, it was um, essay towards reusable charts. I'll show you an example, um, but uh, if, if you're interested in building apps or, or visualizations with D3, check Check this article out. Um, I also, um, in the slides, there'll be this link. I, the, the way he has you implement charts was just kind of a bit of boilerplate, and I had a situation where I was like needing a lot of reusable charts. So I wrote something that can help um, to, to reduce some of the boilerplate of creating these um, charts themselves. But I'll, right now, I'll just show you an example of using them. You'll note it uses that call thing again to essentially um, we can instantiate a chart. We don't have to like always have this deeply nested structure stuff, right? Like that you wouldn't want your whole app to just be like this giant like arrow, right? Um, so this reusable charts pattern lets us kind of create in in the normal D3 usage a chart, right? We say we'll do a spark line. We say I want a new spark line. It's going to be this size. We'll use this color scheme or whatever. You kind of configure your chart. Um, and then you can apply that chart to an element in your DOM. Or um, with that same chart, you can apply that to multiple elements in your DOM. Uh, this is a, D3 is very composable. It, it seems to be very like kind of functional programming inspired where you're, just, you're passing it little functions that do transformations on data um, not in place, but just like saying, OK, like, like the capital letter demo in the list where we just say, here's a function. Leave that data in place, but we'll transform it. That ends up being nicely composable as well. So you can see, in this case, if we want to show data from, say, multiple sensors, we add elements for each one in like the sensors array, add an SVG element, um, do our, our normal like basically D3 boilerplate pattern of enter, exit, and then the updating selection. On the updating selection, instead of our code right here doing all the work, we just 
call the chart and let it do its, all its, its magic um, on that portion of, of the DOM. Um, so if we're building apps, um, we can really use that pattern effectively to just kind of do reusable widgets. Um, say we have a, we want to put a form throughout our app, right? Uh, we can just make a, a survey reusable chart. We'll call it a widget here or something. Uh, configure it with you know whatever our survey data um, options are, and apply it to the DOM in the in the same fashion. And this this is how you can go about like. Building a, a, a bigger app is, is via these you know reusable components, which is obviously a good good useful um, way to build apps. Um, this is not incredibly related to D3 specifically, but I wanted to throw it in here. Just as you're building apps, I still see people like watching for like key up events and stuff. Um, there's a great, uh, fairly modern, but like not too modern that you wouldn't dare use it um, event that. Uh, like text areas, inputs, fire, called input. Um, that pretty much, except in like little older versions of IE, fires like whenever it changes. It's like the change event you always wanted. Um, so don't use key up, don't use change, because change only a lot of times doesn't happen until like there's a blur event or whatever. Input lets you kind of like dynamically keep up with the user's typing. That's a bit of an aside. Um, uh, a more D3 specific thing. When you're building apps, uh, what can come in handy is um, the select operator, again, this is a bit for people who've used D3 before, the select operator actually can take a function. And this, is, uh, this function should return an element, and then that becomes the selection. I, um, and then this is great for advanced DOM manipulation. Like you saw in that, in that app I, sh I showed you, um, uh, one of the kind of challenging components was keeping these um, highlights. The user is able to highlight text. Um, and to show a highlight in the DOM and keep track of where that highlight is, even kind of ignoring where the other highlights are and, and, and all that, requires some kind of crazy DOM manipulation and stuff. And so just the normal, like, apply this data to these elements didn't quite work out. But in this case, the select uh, method was really handy where I could, I could actually create the element myself, do all my crazy DOM manipulation, return that element, and then get back into nice, clean D3 land where I can just say, oh, and this element is classed, highlight, and all that. Um, and an another uh, really useful thing I found when building, building apps with D3 is this uh, kind of, it, it's documented in public, but uh, he calls it an internal function, um, D3 dispatch. D3 Dispatch provides a convenient, lightweight me mechanism for loosely coupled components. That loosely coupled component should be the first clue that, hey, this is something we want when we're building apps, that we don't want to end up just like this tangled mess of, of uh, code that's dependent on itself. Um, so I found that's kind of useful in yeah, kind of a controller setting where you, you say, hey, there's portions of my DOM that I, I want to just kind of update all at once. You can kind of make, say, a controller object or something more or less subclass it off of, uh, you extend a dispatch object, um, add your own methods there. In your methods, if you, if you change something, I'm realizing this, this example is a little confusing. Uh, the, the dot change 42, that parameter there is just to show that you can pass parameters. Um, you would actually just change your data in the spot I just kind of snipped out. Um, change your data, and then just say, you know, on your dispatch, you say dot event name and call that as a, as a method, anybody who's listening for that will then get that event, so to speak, and any parameters you pass when you're calling that method. So that's, that's real useful as well. Um, another um, kind of trick when you're, you're writing apps is just keep in mind like whether, I call this view model versus stateful DOM. One of the kind of the challenges in, in building web apps uh, is like the DOM kind of already has its own little like, not really models, but views and controllers and stuff, right? Like you can store state. A checkbox remembers if it's checked or not. You know, that kind of stuff. And just, you want to be mindful of like where like the canonical version is stored. Like maybe it's okay to just let that checkbox store the state until you, the user presses save and then you do it. 
Maybe in your case, you want to make sure that the JavaScript objects, you know, the in-memory objects are what are the real state. But just keep that in mind. Um, D3 is great, though, of course, at, at taking that in-memory object and pushing it to the DOM. Um, so what to expect? Um, hopefully, you've gotten a bit of a sense that, that um, like I was saying, D3 is great at pushing uh, in-memory JavaScript state, so to speak, and syncing that to the DOM, right? It's not quite as elegant um, pushing back. So I'm going to go through just kind of some of the good stuff, the bad, and the only ugly. We can deal with ugly sometimes. So, uh, form control, stateful elements get a bit weird. I'm running a little short on time, so I'll just kind of skip over that. Um, this is really, though, an example of that. It's a bit repetitive, right? So. Uh, if you do want to sync data back, you, it is kind of a manual process. So if you want to, say, set an in, input's value, uh, when you create the element, set its value property to your data's whatever field you're using, right? When you're handling the change event, you got to uh, actually, it, it, the code ends up being repetitive, right? You can't just, it's not like some frameworks you can be just like, bind the field to the value of this element, and then you're done. You kind of handle, have to handle both ends. Like you could argue that it's great because it's explicit, but you're arguing, so maybe yeah, maybe that is is something to consider. Um, skip over these here. Um, another uh, tr kind of trouble spot with D3 is accessing parent data. What I mean by this is, uh, for example, in my app we have uh, like a note card uh, highlight they can they can edit. We let them tag those. Um, and in the edit interface here, where the, the user like wants to edit the tags, it's natural to kind of separate that out and, and throw that in like a reusable component, like a, a, a tags widget or a tags reusable chart. Um, but you end up with this, this trouble where um, the way D3 binds data, it's not natural to like, if you need to edit something in an array, you kind of know where it is in the array. But unless you've done something in your code to give you access to that array later in your callback, you have the item, you have its index in the array, but you don't have a, a reference to the array itself. Um, this is actually something that the author of, of D3 um, has known about for some time and has kind of some notes and on approaches to solving that problem in a very early bug ticket. Um, uh, but overall, um, I found it to be a pretty big win for, for apps that are um, presentation heavy with, with some light manipulation or you know, moderate, moderate manipulation, which, um, as at least Brett Victor would argue, is, is a good way to, to design apps. Um, D3 is a very clean API, very focused, uh, and it's also composable, which is a, a great feature you want when you're, you're writing apps. Um, so this app. It may not be pretty yet, but it, it's, it's certainly a very complex app, and I think D3 has served it very well. Um, so thanks. <laughs>